We're going to have Kings at College in the booth back. I think Kelsey is helping us with that. You go in the hallway, there's an information booth out there, and they'll let you know all about Kingsgate College. Um, I'm honored to teach as a part of that team, and we've had an amazing uh, group of students. We graduated a group of students this past uh, May, and we're going to go for it another year with 12 campuses. So God's doing great things. How many believe that investing in the lives of, of uh, leaders, young adults who are learning God's Word is important? You believe that? So we're making that investment. I know that's been a dream in Bishop Pastor Kathy's heart for a very long time. And we, we have an active college campus here. So I want you to see the booth out there. Just stop by, get some swag, some gear, and learn more about how you can onboard. If you're an adult learner, we've got all kinds of options for you. If you're a student coming up, we have options for you as well. Incredible tuition rate. So you just really need to ask that team. Would you stand with me today? How many of you sense the presence of God this morning? Amen. I'm just grateful for our worship team. Would you give them a hand today, our worship team that always leads us? Thank you, Ashley and team. You're the man. I'm just trying to look like you. You're the fashion expert around here, Ashley. God bless you. I love you. I, we're in a series on the Holy Spirit called Christianity Light because God has made us for more than we're living oftentimes. Sometimes when we, when we enter into salvation, we often just kind of put it on neutral or cruise control. But salvation is only the entry point of God's purpose and plan for your life. We weren't meant for Christianity light. I, I like to, I like to uh, work out and, and there's, uh, there's supplements you use. And there's this one thing I learned. I started doing this about six months ago or eight months ago. And uh, it's something called pre-workout. Anybody ever heard of pre-workout? you got to be careful with this stuff just if you haven't. Because I, I'm actually a little hypersensitive to caffeine. And I decided to go. I thought, you know, I, I'm going to get this stuff. It's going to really give me some energy. I decided to double down on the scoop. And about 10 minutes, my face was on fire. It was, I don't know if I did well in the workout or not because I didn't feel anything ever. I just was amped up. But there's something about Christianity that should be amped up. There's something about our faith that should be amped up because we are Holy Spirit-fired, passionate believers that are living out justice in our world and that are representations of the image of God. Come on, somebody. And we're not just cruising it out until heaven comes. Come on, heaven is coming to this earth. We're bringing heaven into our now, amen? So I want you to read with me. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2. I want to read it to, towards the end. Bishop's talk, taken, taken us through several different passages, passages on the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about stepping into the river. How many enjoyed that message? You need to go back and get that if you didn't. We, we looked at John 7, and we've looked at Acts chapters 1 and the first part of Acts chapter 2. I want to move to the end of Acts chapter 2. And this is after Peter preaches this message. And we're going to look at verse uh, 29. After Peter preaches this message out of Pentecost Sunday. It's the, the Feast of Tabernacle, the, the, we, we call it Pentecost, where there was a gathering in, in Jerusalem after the resurrection of Christ. It's 50 days after that resurrection. Very significant moment for the church. And let's look at Peter's message at the end of, uh, at verse 29, at the end of his, his sermon there, right, to, the, to all those who gathered around. He says, Brothers, I may say to you with the confidence that the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and he's in a tomb that is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, somebody say this Jesus, this Jesus, God raised him up. And of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received the from the Father, look at this, the promise of the what? The Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing now. In other words, there was on display the pouring out of the promise of the Holy Spirit in that moment. And they're witnessing to it. Look at verse 36. Let the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, who's Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, 
they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Or what is the meaning of this? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you, somebody say you, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look at this. For the promise is for you. Say it's for me. And it's for your children. And look at this. I love this, these layers. It's for me. It's for my children. It's for all. Somebody say all. All who are far off. And everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. The spirit power of God is for you. It's for me. It's for all. It has been unleashed into our world and now we are agents of that very spirit. Do you believe that today? So Father, today we receive this gift of the Holy Spirit as you speak. I release that spirit into this house online. Lord, someone viewing later on. Lord, the spirit has no bounds. It is limitless. So we ask Lord, now come unleash upon us, Lord, and change our lives by your power in Jesus' name. Can you shout amen? I want to talk to you today about the centrifugal power of the Holy Spirit. Why don't you greet somebody and tell them there's power on the inside of you. There's power. There's power on the inside of you. Amen. Glad to be together at the one service we're doing through the summer. And I want to just share this message that God's given me. I'm honored to be a part of this church team and, and uh, leading with following Bishop and Pastor Kathy, thankful for them. I love this series because we're talking about a moment in time where the church really gets its birthing point. It's, it's a transition of the narrative of all God is doing throughout humanity. And I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but as you look at all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, if you just begin to zoom out and you see all that God's doing, there are lots of breaking points and lots of discrepancies throughout Scripture, but if you see through the meaning of Jesus, you see there is this overarching plan and purpose of God to take us from the garden back to the garden. To take us from fellowship and feasting with God to revelation where we feast together at the table of the Lord. And, and this, this work of the Holy Spirit is being done in Acts chapter 2 where there's this release, what we call Pentecost, this release of the power of God. Jesus is, is spending time with his disciples. He has been raised from the dead. You read right there in Acts 2, Peter said, we are witnesses of his resurrection. We've talked about that some. And now he is witnessing that resurrection power that is invading, consuming, animating, and empowering the lives of all those who will receive it. And he says, it is for all. Somebody say all. The church in that moment began to learn that we are not simply a group of people waiting for Jesus to come back to get us. We are a group of empowered individual agents of the kingdom that are steady on a course to see God's kingdom come. His will be done on earth. Come on, somebody. Just like it is. In where? In heaven. We're not just sitting idly by. We are steadily bringing in the power of God. In fact, Habakkuk 2 says it this way, that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's all-consuming. It's saturating. There's not a portion of the ocean floor that is not covered. And I'm here to say today, I believe that God's taken to us a day when there's not a portion of this earth that does not see the power and the presence and the saturation of God's kingdom made real by the Holy Spirit. We weren't made to wait out the clock, church. I'm going to say that again. We weren't made to wait out a clock. We're not counting down to the end of us. We're counting up to the culmination of the consummation of a kingdom that is real and present and available. 
for those who will call on. That's what Peter's saying for all those who will call. Oftentimes we read Peter's message and we say, well, you've got, well, God's waiting on certain people he's calling. It's just, we're just trying to wake people up to call on him. And when they do, he will answer and fill everyone. I, I want to get to a couple of things I want to share by the Holy Spirit, but I thought as I was praying through this weekend, I thought about uh, a um, one of the most interesting thing that's happened to me. I grew up on the East Coast, so we know all about hurricanes, and, and we have our share of storms, but there's something very unique about the weather pattern in Oklahoma. Now, if you're online and you don't know, you, you just have, I, you just, you can't explain it. You kind of just have to live it, and, and so I started living that out at, when we moved here, and I remember, you know, we've known Bishop Pastor Kathy and lots of this team for, for longer, for over half our life, really, and uh, they would talk about it. We came to Affecting Destiny every year. I remember one year we came to Affecting Destiny. It was like late April, and it was a blizzard. So that was weird. But um, I thought, well, maybe that was just, you know, just a crazy thing that happened. Turns out that's how things are around here. <laughs> and one of the things that I learned as you watch, as you uh, get accustomed to the news, is um, the local news stations are helping us out with this. Because they have something they call news, but it seems more like entertainment to me. And I thought to myself, I'm going to be a grown adult here and not get into this. But I'm honest with you, I'm hooked. I get that TV going, and, and uh, now I know everybody's got their news channel. I got, I got David Payne. He just seems to get... <laughs> only in Oklahoma does a local newsman get applause, really. I mean, I don't even know. You know, how does that happen? Only in Oklahoma, you know, I'm with David or you know, whatever. Okay, so he, I'm watching, I'm telling you, it's incredibly entertainment and, and entertaining. And so I'm learning as I'm watching the weather patterns, uh, there are certain things unique about Oklahoma, like uh, thunder sleet. Thunder sleet. Mm -hmm. what, what is thunder sleet? Apparently, there's also thunder snow. All y'all shaking your head like this is normal. This is not normal. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, actually, I'm a pretty well-traveled person. I've been to a lot of places. I've been around the world. This is really unique. And then I found out there's such thing as a quake NATO. Now, come on, somebody. That, that just, something does not seem right about a quake NATO. All of these, these weather patterns. And so, you know, you say, Pastor Dave, where are we going with this? I'm getting somewhere. Where? <laughs> As you, it's, it's hard. You get caught up on Oklahoma weather in a hurry. But one thing that as I watch, you know, they, these guys, and I give them a hard time, they, they know what they're doing, and it's good that we have that kind of information and data. And, and as I watch um, Brother David Payne, as he's, he's, he's blessed uh, Brother David Payne, as he's on his screen and he's shouting out commands to, to, um, to the... Um, the soldiers on the front line there. It's like, it's like a war room in there for real. And, uh, you know, go to this. Let's go to, let's go to Val on the Gittner. I don't know. I, can someone tell me what Val and a Gittner is? I got no idea. I just know when he says it, I get excited because something is about to happen. Let's go to Val on the Gittner. I don't, is that in the Bible? I don't know. Maybe Val and the Gittner, maybe it's a prophetic sign. I don't know. I, I get to watch him. He gets around here, and he starts saying, you know, you can see that wall cloud, folks. See that wall cloud. And I know some things now. You've got to look for a wall cloud. It helps to actually watch them because you do want to live, right? So you, um, you want to know if there's a tornado nearby, right? And so um, when I got here, I made good friends with people with storm shelters. So we make sure that this, this, the tornado David Payne watching party is always at the people with the storm shelter. That's where we have a um, thing. And, and I know that I'm getting off track, but we, we, always we always tell the kids you can take one thing down into the, the uh, cellar just in case we lose it all. My son decided to take his pocket knife. So, I, you know, <laughs> not a picture of us, you know, not the Bible. I'm doing great. My parenting is amazing, uh, clearly. So he said you got this wall cloud, and he says you can see that turning. And so what I learned was is that, that in a tornado, as you're watching that, it starts, it starts high and large, and there's this, this spin that starts to happen, this, this centripetal force that begins to turn and turn and turn wide. And so it's, it kind of starts like this, and you know, forgive my, my art, but it begins to, to go around in a circle, right? And what happens on the next round? Well, 
a little tighter, right? A little tighter, and it just keeps going. A little tighter, a little tighter, and just keeps going around and around and around until it comes to this this funnel shape that begins to generate power and energy and suction. And so all of the, the, the power and the strength is drawn in through this centripetal force. And, and really, this is a great way. And as I, as I begin, you know, get revelation watching David Payne, what can I say? You, you, you begin to watch this force. This is a great way to understand what God is doing through the Old Testament narrative. Okay? I want to show this to you. So, as in, in Scripture from Genesis all the way through Christ, there's this beginning of these outward rings of turning. And we see this in Genesis, in creation, on the outside here. Okay, in Genesis 1. Now you just have to write your own version of this map, and, and if it helps you, it helps you. If it doesn't, just get the idea. Creation begins here. Then we move in to Abraham, right? Then we move closer to Israel and the promise of a people God's making. Then we move to the prophets. So as we're moving inward, the, the presence of God, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is drawing us closer and closer. There's this wall cloud, if you will, that's circling around high and high in Genesis chapter 1. And then it keeps moving and it keeps moving. But all of these things are drawing in the work and the presence of God. And all of them are pointing to one thing, to Christ. All that God is doing is pointing into Christ. We like to read these things oftentimes in just segments and say, and we just like to take it all as just, well, I'll do Genesis here, or I'll do Abraham here, and, and I'll do the promise here, and God's. And we take things out of context instead of realizing that what God's doing through this centripetal force is he's slowly but surely drawing, drawing people in, in through the prophets. And see, there are things that happen out here in these outer rings that don't necessarily match what's happening in the inner, but they're all being used by God not as equally right or they're not all necessarily all that God is approving of. What he is doing, though, is he's using that force to draw people and point people through the prophets down into the manifestation of the one and only incarnate one, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So in our life, we have some of these same instances that we have the Holy Spirit at work in our life in these outer rings. And sometimes we don't realize what God is doing. We get discouraged on the outer ring. We get, we get, we get confused. We don't, we don't understand how God could you be a part of this. But the thing that we need to remember in Genesis 1, that the, the Spirit of God was hovering or brooding over the face of the deep. Genesis 1 and 1 and 2. The Holy Spirit, how many of you realize the Holy Spirit didn't just decide to wake up and come to the earth in Acts chapter 2? I'm here to tell you the Spirit's work was centripetal, pulling in like a tornado all throughout the Old Testament narrative. In Genesis 1, he begins to brood. He begins to hover. He begins to draw out. That word in the Hebrew means it's like a, it's like a mother a bird uh, hovering over the nest to bring life. Can I say this something to you today? Even in your places of confusion or distraction or places of disappointment, the Holy Spirit is hovering over your dark places. He's hovering over. The, in fact, in, 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 Hebrew, uh, lots, in Hebrew, lots of literature, there is this idea that, that the waters are dark and mysterious. There are going to be parts of your life that you're not going to understand. But hear, hear me tell you this, the Spirit is hovering. He's hovering on your outer rings. So, so sometimes you'll have, you'll have a, a disappointment, okay, don't, I'm, I'm just going to just fly through them quick. Disappointment. Sometimes you'll have a failure. Okay? You might have a success. You might have something that you win on, something that you, that you do well, and you're excited about that. But can I say that here, here, and here, the Holy Spirit is still doing his work? You might have a victory. You might have a win. And it, then you also might have a season of confusion. But all of it is leading you inward and pulling you toward one thing. It's pointing you toward the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, what looks often like chaos and dysfunction in your life might just be the start of God's master plan. Somebody needs to hear that today. What looks like it's just dysfunction. It might be that God is doing something 
in your life and setting you up for his perfect plan. There's some things that we get confused of and we get discouraged of, but but I want to say this to you today, that we often want God to give us, listen to this, we want God to give us a plan. Instead, he gives us a promise. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. We want God to give us a plan, but instead he gives us a what? Promise. See, God doesn't tell you all that he's going to do because you wouldn't do it if he did. Why? Because we, we like the manifestation of the miracle, but we don't like the process of getting to the miracle. Can I say something to you, brothers and sisters, this morning, that the process is making you into the person. The miracle is not the issue. God will already do what he said he'll do. The miracle, the supernatural, we think is the amazing thing. Can I tell you the amazing thing? It's when a man or woman would say, God, change my life. God, shape my life. God, use my life. God, change my thing. God changed my behavior. God changed my talking. God changed my acting. God changed my parenting. God changed my business. That's the miracle that has to happen. The supernatural is the sure thing. The God is, in, is not giving us a plan. He's inviting us into a promise. So what do we ask sometimes on these outer rings? We ask things like, God, why would you let that happen? God, why would you bring me this far just to let me fail? Do you not love me? Do you, did I, how about this one? God, what did I do wrong? Let me realize if you'll take credit for the wrong, you'll also take credit for the right. If you'll own the things, if you somehow believe that your, your time of of mystery or your time of confusion or your time of disappointment is all because of your actions. Whenever you achieve it, you'll be tempted to own those actions too, to own those results. God, I obeyed you and still everything around me seems to be falling apart. Can I suggest to you today that that is indicative of the work of the Holy Spirit? I know that Jennifer and I, in our own life, there was several years back, we We launched out and obeyed God. Can I tell you something? When you obey God, you need to understand that you might have assurances and you might have um, affirmations and and you might have all of your ducks in a row or all your things in place, but if you're going to follow Jesus, you have already entered into the way of suffering and the way of trial. If Jesus is going to walk it, I guarantee you're going to walk it. If you want God's best, you're going to do it God's way. And so Jennifer and I, we walked through a season where we thought we're going to follow God. We're going to answer God's, God's um, response to our life. And it was in a season where, I mean, you know, full transparency, there, when you're young and, and you're coming along, sometimes you do think you're the gift of God to the church and you think you're amazing. And you, we, we weren't at that stage, hallelujah. We moved on a little past that. That's what kids will do for you. <laughs> they have a way of reminding you. <laughs> they have a way of reminding you. How amazing you are not. <laughs> so we had had kids for a while. And, uh, and so we, we just were, we truly were just sincere and humble. God, how do you want to use this? We weren't, how many of you realize one of the worst ways to leave one season is because you hate the previous one? That'll help somebody today. We, we weren't, we, we had, thank God for, our, you know, spiritual parents in our life, Pastor Kathy and Bishop, they just, they began to shape us and mold us and lead us and mentor us. And so we entered a season, we said yes to God. When we said yes to God, we knew God's plan was there. We knew his purpose was there. We weren't wrestling with the call of God. We weren't wrestling necessarily with the how. But when we obeyed, we entered into a wilderness season of our life. We entered into a time where it felt like we had done something wrong. There was a wrestling on the inside. There was a disappointment on the inside. But I came to realize if I didn't say yes to that season, I couldn't have the breakthroughs of my now season. If I didn't walk through, come on somebody, if I didn't walk through the hard times of saying yes to the trial and yes to the cross, if I don't walk the wilderness, if I don't walk the the road up to Calvary myself, I can never experience the resurrection power of the cross in my life. Let me say something to you today. Resurrection doesn't happen without death. Yeah. 
We like to shout the victory of God, but resurrection doesn't happen without death. Your bad days, your good days, your obedience, your disobedience. Let me suggest to you today the Holy Spirit is working in all of it. And he's bringing those in. Your dreams, your opportunities, your failures. He's working them all toward the Christ. Just a little side note here that might help you. If you ever want to know who God is like, start with Jesus. If you want to know what scripture means, start with Jesus. If you want to understand your life and all the things around it, you're not going to understand perfectly, but I guarantee you, start with Jesus. And he brings this revelation. The cross is what every dream and every disappointment and every pain is about. It's all about the cross. Somebody say it's about the cross. Something happens in this narrative of Scripture around the turn of the incarnation of Christ that this centripetal force that's drawing things in and drawing things in, in Acts chapter 2, it begins to change. There's this resurrection that the disciples witness to. And they, they enter into the upper room and all of a sudden it begins to pour out the other way. Now the force begins to move outward. Over and over and over. And we start with... 140, 140 on the, on the, uh, in the upper room. Then we move to, what, 3,000 plus pouring out into the, into the streets of Jerusalem. Then we move to the region of Judea. Then we move to Greece and Antioch. And then we move to the world, the Gentile world where we are today. So let me, sh- let me just point this out, this picture out. This is a great way to understand the work of the uh, New Testament narrative. The Old Testament drawing people in. Now, this, this isn't to say, I, hear, me, hear me out, this is important. I, I, I realize that I'm teaching a little bit, and this might be a bit of a different than preachy sermon, but I want you to see this. I think this will make a difference in your life. The, what God is doing in the Old Testament didn't just stop or somehow become irrelevant because of what God is doing now in the New. Somebody needs to hear me say that, Okay. This force is still drawing people to Christ. But what's so amazing about God is he begins to do another force at the same time. We have this inward drawing centripetal force. And now we have this centrifugal force that's now drawing people out and going out and going out and further and further and covering the earth like the waters cover the sea. God's doing a new thing. God's changing through the revelation of of Christ, what Christ has done on the cross, it becomes this launching pad. And that's what I love about this this picture is that God is drawing me into him. Why? Not so he can lead me there, so he can launch me out. You just can't contain the Holy Spirit. That, that's the problem, church, is that we, can, we that's our, one of our core commitments. We're not going to do church so we control the Holy Spirit. We're going to have order. We're going to have understanding. But there's something about what God is doing that becomes a launching pad that sends people out. We're not just trying to see who gets in or who gets out anymore. We're trying to see how far God can go. We're trying to get in line with this generation to generation, people group to people group, across borders and around the world, unstoppable force. So now what is God doing? He's adding this this pull in to this launching out. And now you have both together and you get this radical Jesus people. The world is looking for a radical Jesus, people. They don't, inspiration is good. Inspiration is good. Motivation is good. All of that is for one thing, is to point people to resurrection. Point people to the power of God on display at work in our lives. God is constantly at work shaping us, molding us. If we're going to be the church, we have to be the church of the drawing in and a church of the launching out. 
What does that mean in your day to day? You ought to be moving through the power of the Holy Spirit. Your life should be attractive. It should be like a tornado. It should be sucking people in. It should be drawing people in. Can I say to you today, if you're miserable, if you're, 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 your whole life is dysfunctional in a way where, where you're just living in any how you want and it's not attractive, then we're not doing the work of the Holy Spirit. Your life should be drawing people in. And listen to this. Once it draws people in, it's not so that you can say, now we're on the in group. It's to equip, empower, and launch people out into the nations of the world to divide down dividing walls, to break down racial barriers, to break down national borders, to break down people group barriers and say, God, you're going to cover it all. We're a kingdom people. We're not just a national people or a cultural people or a family people. We're a kingdom people. And your kingdom is covering the earth. The world is looking for a church who gets that revelation. The world is looking for a church who lives by the power of the Holy Spirit that has been launched out. And I'm asking you today, I'm challenging you today to keep drawing the circle bigger. I left an arrow on the end because it keeps going. I don't have enough board to draw all that God is doing in the earth. I want to say to you today that the book of Acts is still being written. It's written in you. Bishop mentioned this last week. There is, no, there is no conclusive ending to Acts. It just drops out. Why? Because you're still living it. And the Holy Spirit is still drawing lines. And he's still drawing people in. Can you say amen? amen? Let me give you these three things I want to share about your life and the work and the shaping of the Holy Spirit. How does God power, God's Holy Spirit power, shape our lives? We're going to write them down. First thing is, is the work of the Spirit is a setup. The work of the Holy Spirit is a setup. Nothing God does is unintentional. I don't know what your understanding of sovereignty, but mine is my understanding is that God has a way of finding a way to use all things. And he will orchestrate them. There, there's no one smarter, no one more understanding. He is our creator. He knows what to do. And it's a setup. Acts chapter 2, we have this gathering in Jerusalem. And what's interesting is, listen to this, that, that Israel, God's people, they're actually under oppression. They're living at, at, under the rule, uh, under the violent rule. Violence by way of, or peace by way of war. That was Romans, that was the Roman uh, motto, peace by way of war. It was the gift of peace through violence. And so they're living under that reality. And it doesn't seem like it's God's plan. In fact, through all throughout Scripture, and throughout the Old Testament and through the Intertestament period and, and then into the, the New Testament, as Jesus comes, people are asking this question, Jesus, when are you going to deliver us? The disciples keep asking that question. I don't know if you remember back the story about John and his brother. They said, Lord, we, we want to make sure, their mother says, we want to make sure they're sitting at your right and their left. Let me tell you, don't, don't spiritualize it. They wanted to be in charge of things. They wanted to be military commanders one and two. And Jesus continually says, I must give my life so that another kingdom can come. And, they, and it's still hard for them to understand. They don't, they don't get it. They're living under oppression. They're looking for freedom. But this is something that God is doing. They can't understand. Why would God allow this to happen? How you, would you do this? Surely this must be a mistake. Acts chapter 1, Jesus is actually risen from the grave. He's, he's in mysterious bodily form, resurrection. I don't know what that looks like, but that's got to be amazing. And he's, and he's, he's talking to his disciples, and they say, this is great, Jesus. When are you going to defeat the Romans? And Jesus is like, I was thinking, you know, face palm, right? It's like, I don't know what else to say. I've spent all this time teaching that another kingdom is coming and you're still, I'm about to leave. Y'all know that, right? And you're asking me the same question, but it's the same question we always ask. Lord, when are you going to stop this? Because clearly this isn't your will. When are you going to make this stop? When are you going to defeat those bad people? When are you going to make those guys suffer because they deserve it? We're always asking that question. And Jesus says, I'm from another kingdom. What's happening is going to be good for you and for them. It's bad when God says he's going to bless people that you don't approve of. I'll keep moving because I'm, I'm going to lose the crowd. I'll just keep going. I, I'm just saying that in that time, that, that oppression, 
Roman, uh, Roman society, Roman technology had created a, a um, traveling system that allowed for travel communication that would have, would have normally been impossible or taken years. It allowed communication to happen within weeks or months throughout all the known civilization they had spread. They had invested in the infrastructure. How many like some of the Oklahoma counties to hear that right there. Get, get some good roads, right? Get some, get some nice streets, you know. Well, the, the Romans had built a lot of infrastructure, right, all throughout that city. And when, when Acts 2 happens and the Holy Spirit breaks out, it became possible immediately for the message of the gospel to go down that road to Capernaum and go down that road to Greece and Antioch, that God had already set things up so that when he let loose at Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, that the spread of the gospel could start immediately in like wildfire. Can I suggest today that God was at work through oppression, through the, the violence, through the warring. God was, the enemy thought, I'm going to destroy God's people. And God said, I'm going to use that. Can I suggest to you today that your life has several things that you thought, why is this happening to me? Why is that person so oppressive? Why is this, this society and culture so intent on destroying my life? I want to say to you today, God's going to use that. I'm not suggesting for a minute that that's God's final plan. I'm just saying that there's nothing that God cannot use to bring about his plan. When a people begin to say, Holy Spirit, what are you doing in my life? I'm going to get on board with it. The very thing you're cursing might be the thing God's using to lead you to a promise. Scripture calls it the fullness of time. This that spirit hovering over our lives. At Jeremiah chapter 1, 11 says that God says to Jeremiah, I am watching over my word to perform it. I love the idea of my life and all of the world being a stage and the Holy Spirit is conducting every move. And when someone jumps on stage at the wrong time, he just knows. It's all, listen, you just can't get outside of the power and the presence and the move of the Holy Spirit because it's everywhere. And God is using it all. Somebody say it's a setup. Your life is being orchestrated by God. I want you to see that today. I want you to determine that today. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to quit kicking and fighting and just start resting. Stop trying to perform your way to the will of God and start getting in the flow of the Holy Spirit. You don't know what he's going to do, nor, neither do I. You might think you have an idea. All, can I say this to you? All you can do is obey today. You obey today and you don't worry about tomorrow. You get in the flow. It's amazing what will happen. If you've seen somebody that, that um, when they tell you when you're drowning or you're, they're in a, in a river. Sometimes you just have to relax and let your body float. Some of us need to relax because we're drowning, but we're not drowning because someone's pushing us under. We're drowning because we're flailing around and we can't let our lives and our spirits do what they were made to do, which is float in the river. Somebody get in the river. Somebody get in the river today and just let God take you. It's going to get rapid, rough and, and, and uh, the rapids are going to be bad sometimes, but, but God's got this. Amen? Yeah. Number two, the Spirit delivers through baptism. Not only is it a setup, but the Spirit delivers through baptism. You know, the Exodus narrative is in the salvation narrative in Scripture, the, the message of salvation is all about deliverance through things, not around things. The Red Sea parts, come on, the people of God walk through. God's salvation is about taking you through the waters and through the fire. There's a story of Daniel. He takes you into the fire so that he can show you that who he is. They can I say something? You won't know the true power of God until you go into the water. You won't know his power to save until you need saving. You won't know his power to deliver from fire until you're in the fire and you come out not smelling like smoke. Somebody ought to say amen to that. You can't know God delivers until you walk out, Daniel, from the fire and you've got nothing 
to show for it. Except that there was a fourth man. You just need to get in the fire and get in the water and look for the fourth man. You need to get in, the, in that, that flow of what God's doing and look for the thing that assures you that God is in control. God delivers by baptism. When the crowd responds to Peter, what does Peter say? Peter replies, they ask him, what does all this mean? What should we do? And Peter says, repent and what? Be baptized. Can I suggest to you today that Peter, that, that this idea of, of we get caught up in the, the, um, the pictures of the church, we should all be baptized. That, that is a, a picture of what God's doing, but it's also a manifestation of God's power that reminds us what life is like. Life is like going into, life in Christ is like going into the water, dying and coming back up. In other words, now that Jesus has set you free, start acting like the old person is gone. You're doing things and you go through the water of fire and baptism so that you can come out new. Jesus' primary message was this. Listen to this. His primary message was this. Repent for the kingdom has come. We hear that message and oftentimes we like to think, repent, you better get on God's side or you're going to be on the outside. But what God's really saying, what Jesus' message really is, is repent. You're doing it wrong. Start living like you've been empowered to live because in the end, I'm going to cover all the earth. I'm drawing all men. Repent and, 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 and respond because the kingdom is really a, a message of wake up. You're sleepwalking. Too many of us live our Christian life this way. We, in, we receive the gift of grace. We live, I love this, the song we sing. We live in the reign of grace. We absolutely live in the reign of grace. I don't have to perform for salvation. I don't have to earn it. It's freely offered to me. But that offering is not just so that I could one day be with Jesus. It's so that I can be with him now. It's so that I can bring him into my now. It's the reign of grace, not later on. The reign of grace is now. Baptism reminds me that it's a process. I must go through it and not around it. If the testing season is not meant, it's not meant to ruin you. It's the Spirit of God delivering you from your old man into your new self. Can I say something to you today? You don't do it once. I die daily. Baptism is every day. And when we are baptized, when you come up from the water, no one, guess, no one has to guess that you were just in the water. When you come up from baptism in the Spirit, people shouldn't have to guess how it is or where it is you've been. It ought to be saturating your life. It ought to drip from your side. It ought to pull, drip off of your tongue. It ought to drip off of your lips. It ought to drip off the way that you respond to people. Your hands and feet should be constantly saturated by the power of the Holy Spirit because you've been baptized in the water again and again and again. I want to suggest to you the church often tries to live in a moment where we say, well, God belongs to us instead of saying we belong in Christ to God. The moment you think you, that God belongs to, to you, you've stepped over into the power of empire, not the power of the cross. So baptism is key. I know there's a lot there and we can unpack, but I'm going to give you this last point and then I'm going to let you go today. Not only do we need, you know, we know it's a setup. It's also the, the, the passage through baptism, but also the Holy Spirit's work is never ending. His power is limitless and without borders. It's a centrifugal force going around and around and around and around. This, this drawing that I made, it's the Holy Spirit making the church into a radical, prophetic Jesus people. See, too often we stop at being saved instead of reading on to see what God's doing. And I want to read this last passage as we close and our team will come. It's Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. I'll just read it right here. It's after Peter preaches. And this is what happens. I want to show you what happens after God's people get into the full of the Holy Spirit, into the shapings of God. The believers, verse 42 the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, 
to their shared meal. That's the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. That's what they were doing. And to the prayers. Verse 43, a sense of awe came over everyone. And God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers, look at this, they were united and they shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who had need of them. Every day they met together in the temple and they ate in their homes together. They shared their food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and they demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. And then what happened? What happened in verse 47? The Lord did what? The Lord added daily to the community of those who were being saved. Don't miss verse 42 through 46. There is a distinct flavor of those who have been baptized in water and are being shaped by the Holy Spirit. They share their meals. They're united together. They eat together. They meet together. They distribute in need. They love each other. They live out covenant faithfulness one to another and they add people daily because they realize what God is doing is not just for me it's for everybody and God adds daily see we're a peculiar people Peter says you're a holy nation you're a chosen people a peculiar people you're a different breed can I suggest to you today that when you let the Holy Spirit work in your life like I'm talking about you will be more human than you ever were I'm here to suggest that God is taking us back to Eden, back to fellowship, back to community. And I'm just suggesting, I'm just radical enough to believe that this kingdom is so powerful and His Holy Spirit is moving so wide that it's drawing more and more people, even you, even me, even the one that we thought could never make it in. God's power is limitless. It's without borders. And I want to say something to you today. And this is what I'm going to end with. You, this is what God told me to remind you. You, many of you have made it to the center, to to the cross. You've made it salvation. But God's about to launch you out in this season. You've You've been discouraged. You've been disappointed. But it's all been pointing one way. It's all been pointing in into the cross and you, you're walking into death and resurrection but I want to suggest to you today that God's taking you from resurrection and he's taking you out he's launching you out he's got a plan for you he's got a purpose for you he's got a purpose for the madness he's got a reason for the chaos he's got a reason for the pain that you've been going God doesn't waste a thing he will take all of it he will mold it by the Holy Spirit he will set you up so that he will launch you out and your life will be a witness in this earth for God's goodness and his mercy come on can you stand to your feet with me let's just stand up and just begin to lift our hands up Just lift your hands now and let's just ask now. Holy Spirit, come. I just want to invite you in this moment. Whatever it is God's doing in your life, I want you to make yourself available for it. The worship team's going to lead us. We're just going to begin to worship. But I want the Holy Spirit to fill this place. To impart a new level of revelation to you. Somebody needed this word today. Somebody's launching out from a place of resurrection this morning. New level, new level. Somebody is leveling up. You're launching from a place of baptism out into a new day. Father, we thank you today. Well, just worship with us, team. Can you just worship? Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center.
encourage you right now. Holy Spirit, come. come on, someone is being ministered to right now. Someone is being changed. Maybe you're online. You've been dealing with a struggle and it feels like you're lost. I want to speak to you prophetically. It's a setup today. The Holy Spirit is doing a work that you don't understand, but He is not done yet. Somebody needs to hear that. He is not done. He is at work. He is drawing all things to Christ. And so I'm speaking to you today. Whatever it is you're trying to understand, start with Jesus. Maybe you're here today and or you're online. You've not received Jesus. You've not made a commitment of allegiance to Him. Maybe you've said a prayer, but it's not affecting your life. I want to invite you right now to just call out on the name of Jesus and Lord, my life belongs to you. You can say that prayer right now. My life belongs to you. I, I don't want to live it on my own. Some of us who have been in faith for decades need to say that prayer again. Lord, my life belongs to you. Baptize my, my tongue. Baptize my, my thinking. Baptize my hands and feet, my actions, my choices. Baptize my way of seeing my life. Baptize my way of viewing the world. Baptize my way of keeping some out and some in. Holy Spirit, draw the circle bigger. Bless your people today, God. I pray as they call out to you, they would find you in their private place, Lord, their place of devotion, their place of prayer. They would find you in their workplace. They would find you at work in their family. Uncover our eyes. Once you pray that, Lord, I pray in my spiritual eyes that I could see what you're doing, that I would prophetically see what you're trying to accomplish, and I would yield to it. Touch my ears today, and I could hear the voice of God in a new, fresh way. In Jesus' name. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for your spirit and grace. Jesus. Just a sweet spirit here. We receive it in Jesus' name. Thank you. Just a couple more moments. Just can we receive that grace? Sing it again. Nothing in this world Jesus, you're the center. your people today, God. Thank you. They go in your grace and mercy. Power of God upon their life, Lord, and the work of the Holy Spirit calls us to be a radical Jesus people this week so the world will know thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you shout amen? Why don't you love on somebody as you're dismissed today? God bless you. We'll see you next week at 10 a.m.